Well, good morning. Hello, everyone. Good to see you, Brother Ray. It's great to be with you. I'm Corey Kirshner, working with uh, Pastor Ben Jennings at Trinity Baptist uh, in Finley, Ohio. And we're excited to be able to continue our study through First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, and today we're going to be looking at the passage that opens up the book of Second Thessalonians, chapter one, verses three through twelve. Now, Brother Ray, uh, you've um, done a lot of work with this passage here and looking through uh, the subject today we're going to be focusing on is the idea of perseverance uh, with the central theme really being perseverance and how it's tied to faithfulness. Now you mentioned here in the objective sentence that every believer should recognize the Christian virtue of perseverance is closely tied to faithfulness because of three keys. So we're going to look at some through this passage three ideas, three keys that will help us see that how perseverance is closely tied to faithfulness. Now, when we look, think about faithfulness, um, about perseverance, even in our lesson, you mentioned something about uh, athletes and how if you ever see them uh, in, in their, their race or their, their walk, their, their arena, uh, sometimes they, can, they fail, sometimes they fall, sometimes it's not even their fault. Uh, but we kind of see that uh, illustrated in uh, in athletics. Have you ever kind of have you ever seen something like that, Brother Ray? Oh yeah, I, I there are some amazing videos, aren't there, Corey? Of oh, sure. people who have stumbled, they've fallen in a race. Maybe you have one of the other racers go back and actually help them when they've stumbled. Uh, but they get up, and and even though there's no chance of them winning the race. Uh, they continue to persevere until they finish the race, and you just my, you admire that kind of dedication, hard work, uh, perseverance, and yet in our text today, we're going to see that same kind of application that Paul recognizes these faithful, persevering Christians who even in the face of adversity and persecution are continuing to do the best they can. They're determined to uh, do what they're supposed to do in serving Christ. Yep. I actually was looking at um, uh, some illustrations of what you had mentioned about in sports. I, I, there was one I didn't even realize, the Winter Olympics that just passed that were in Japan. There was a runner who was representing um, uh, the Holland, I believe it was, and um, she actually fell. She was running a 1,500-meter race. She fell. She was tripped up by another person. Uh, and on the very last lap of the race, and because of her determination or perseverance, she actually ended up, she got up, and instead of, you know, oh, I'm going to finish the race out, I'll be last, she just booked it, and she actually ended up passing the whole entire group and winning wow. that race, even if, even, even falling, and it was wow. pretty incredible, people were exploding all over, but I, apparently I missed it, but I was watching the Olympics, but it's an incredible, sometimes, yeah, we fall and we just have to finish faithfully and we come in last place. I guess there's other times where we, if we really persevere to the, to the end, we win sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I think it's fitting today since it's Mother's Day mm. that we recognize that, uh, boy, there's hard work and faithfulness and perseverance uh, for every mom. And we applaud them for that. It is an important part of being a good godly mother is just to be there and faithfully serve their children. And uh, so it's probably fitting to uh, observe perseverance on Mother's Day because- uh, oh, yeah, I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there's plenty of moms, probably mine included, that um, are glad they didn't throw in the towel, but really wanted to at, <laughs> at some point, <laughs> at some point in time. Yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, you know, and the whole theme of all this is God will see us through it, Yeah. you know? So, but let so me just look mention, at, we kind of look at Corey, the that, Go ahead. yeah, the context of this, as you mentioned, we are now moving into 2 Thessalonians. Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica on his second missionary trip, and he had gone over to Corinth, and he wrote the first of his two epistles from Corinth back to Thessalonica, and it's estimated that he probably wrote that around 50 AD, which would have made it one of the earliest New Testament books that was written, one of these letters, these epistles. And then he wrote this second epistle 
And some scholars think it happened within even a few weeks of the first letter. Hmm. I, that's probably too quickly, but I think it's reasonable to assume that within a year or at the maximum of two years, Paul wrote this second letter to the Thessalonians, and it was a matter of them, he, he acknowledges, even in our text, how they have withstood all of the persecution, they have persevered, and he applauds them for their amazing faithfulness. And even though there's a lot of kind of parallels between 1 Thessalonians and the second letter to the Thessalonians, uh, he's just reiterating some of these things about the coming of Jesus and the fact that we should remain faithful to the end. And indeed, he gives us some really practical insights on how we should live our life because Jesus is worthy of our best. Amen. I think it's amazing, too, I was looking at this book um, and trying to line up some of these scholarly um, estimations of when this book was written based and also looking at secular history. And this is um, the next person in line who's going to be, I think it was in 54 AD, is going to be Emperor Nero, who gets on the throne. And these are these are absolutely very trying times for believers, and we'll soon see even more of that uh, in secular absolutely. history. So as we look at the text today, uh, we're going to be exploring these three keys. We'll go ahead and jump right in. First, uh, sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3 and 4, we're looking at the first key is the idea of being thankful. The scripture says here, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other ab aboundeth so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. You know, you, that first word there that we sticks out, we are bound. That's mm. kind of an interesting word. It's, it's root uh, in the Greek actually implies that uh, there's a debt that needs to be paid. Uh, mm. There's this moral obligation. Paul says, we are bound uh, to thank God for everything that you have done. And so he's praising the Lord for their faithfulness, their dedication. And it's not born out of guilt or anxiety. He just has got this deeply rooted opinion that I'm obligated to pray on your behalf and thank God always for what you have done. Uh, and, and in fact, he uses that term, which we don't use too much in our English language, but when he says it is meat, uh, as it is meat, it, in other words, he's saying, you know, it's just the right thing for me to do yeah. is to pray, pray to God always for you and to thank him for everything you have done. Certainly thinking about what they've gone through and the testimony that they've had, the appropriate response is thankfulness and yeah. thankfulness to God. And what he's thankful for there in verses three and four, it's, there's a number of points that he highlights, but he, he recognizes among these Thessalonian believers uh, several points that he says he's thankful for. And of course, it's right there in the text. He, he applauds their faith, that it's a growing faith. And even in the face of extreme persecution, these Thessalonian believers are, are exceedingly growing, you know, that's a, that's a interesting way he puts that adjective in there, your, mm. your, your faith, it grows exceedingly, mm. and so he applauds them for that, even in the face of adversity, he also says then charity, he, he recognizes they are a people who love one another, and love other people, and are soul winners, and trying to make an impact upon others, even in times of great adversity. And he, he says, I, listen, I just know from everything I've heard that you continue to grow, you abound in this growth, in this faith, in this love. And he's applauding them for, for all of that. I think that uh, it's interesting he, too, because we've just come out of First Thessalonians. That was one of the... Um, 
commands, the, one of the encouragements that he gave to them was that I want your love to abound more and more. And now he's writing yeah. back to them and saying, good job, guys. I'm yeah. thankful you guys, you guys actually did what uh, the Lord commanded through me to you. And, and it's having an effect on you and around and the world around you. Yeah, he, he, that's very true, Corey. And, and he also said in that last chapter to pray without ceasing. So mm. here he is praying and giving thanks for their persistence. Uh, in verse four, then he uses that term uh, glory so that we ourselves glory in you. And that's the only time in the New Testament that that particular word is used. Mm. Most of the time when we talk about glory, it's, it's glory that's applied Right. To God, God to yeah. recognize and glorify Him, but here Paul is really trying to encourage these Thessalonians in in this time of persecution. Say, you know what? I I, I glory. I take pride in the fact that you guys keep on persevering. You you hold your heads high, mm. and and he goes on then to say, you know, you're an example to all of the other churches. I I, I thought that that was such a significant part of this introduction is that, uh, you know, churches all around Europe are talking about the Thessalonians and the fact that they have such patience and their faith, uh, even in the face of persecution and tribulation, they are enduring. And that gets us right back to the whole idea of perseverance and faithfulness, doesn't it? Absolutely. And that the idea of, of thankfulness in this chapter, obviously, Paul makes it very clear. I think on a personal level, we can be thankful, too, that when we face these kinds of things, we, because of the Holy Spirit living in us, can also respond like the Thessalonians. I think now we're in 2022. What are we, uh, uh, over two, uh, a, little, a, little, a little under 2,000 years later? Um, and we're still looking at the Thessalonian church, and we're being affected because of their of of, of what they've done, because of their um, their their testimony. Yes, we're yes. still being affected. We're still looking at. We're still teaching. Hey, these guys, these guys did it, and uh, we can too. And I also thought it was significant as I thought about our modern situations in our churches that. Just like Paul took the time to tell the Thessalonians, their testimony was known among a whole bunch of other churches because of their steadfastness. You know, I think that can be said when it comes to like missions. Mm. Uh, hey, Trinity Baptist Church in Findlay, Cherry Street Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri, uh, Canton Baptist, all of our churches have a reputation and a testimony of being missions churches. You start talking to an average missionary out on deputation, they'd love to get into these mission-minded churches. And it's because our churches have a testimony that we recognize it's the gospel. Getting the gospel out is the most important thing we can do here in our individual communities and around the world. Absolutely. And we can be thankful to be a part of those kinds of churches. Um I know that when my wife and I were uh, doing some mission work and we were out on deputation, we were absolutely thankful for churches like Cherry Street Baptist Church and Canton and Trinity and the many others yeah. that are involved um, in missions and doing a great job um, preaching and teaching the lost in their own communities, but then sending people out to teach the gospel in other places. So there's thankfulness is the first key. The second key we find in the next five verses, verses five through 10, and that's the key of being trusting. Uh, it says here in verse five, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints 
and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. You know, Corey, uh, these are sobering verses mm. as it spells out the end of those people who are persecuting the Christians, who are Christ deniers, those who have tried to deny and destroy the gospel. These verses talk about how terrible the judgment of God is going to be upon them for doing that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure at times the Thessalonians were tempted to wonder why God wasn't dealing with this injustice and this evil against them. And it kind of reminds us, and I included that in our lesson about the Apostle Paul in the book of the Revelation, or Apostle John in the book of Revelation. And he's writing, he's talking about these martyrs that have been martyred during the tribulation period. And according to Revelation 6.10, it said these tribulation saints are saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Mm. You know, these Thessalonians were facing these tribulations, these persecutions. And no doubt they wondered, God, when are you going to deal with these people that are dealing so unjustly with us? And even in our lesson uh, provided by Explore the Bible, I, I put this quote in there. In the end, the suffering of those who persecute God's people will be worse than anything his children endure. Mm -hmm. and so these are strikingly uh, frightening verses for those people who so hate God and hate God's people that they're persecuting and forcing these believers to uh, suffer and even die. Yeah, uh, and you, you, you account here uh, in verse 5 where he talks about being counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye, ye suffer, and you explore a little bit about this idea of, of this worthiness uh, that comes uh, to those who are suffering that persecution. You know, think, especially in the first centuries, Corey, of the Christian era, these believers were so often being faced with these challenges, and they did. They developed a Christian, really a principle, a, a motif, if you will, that these Christians thought it was an amazing honor for them to be worthy to be considered a persecution. That meant they were doing something right for Jesus. Yeah. And so this whole e emerging principle within the Christian community, when they face persecution, they were deciding, we want to do it like Jesus. We want to face persecution like Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And of course, we remember that uh, the Lord said on the cross, his first words were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so a lot of these Christians started facing persecution and martyrdom, saying those very words, Father, wow. forgive them. And it made such an impact even on their persecutors that they were willing to forgive. And, and they just thought it's, it's amazing that we're worthy of this. Wow. That's hard to think of, isn't it? It sure is. It was, I mean, it's, a, it's quite a challenge, I think, for us today in that. Whenever we see any kind of possible, even a possible persecution coming, we we want to dodge it. We want to figure yep. out how to fix it so it doesn't happen to us. Um, you know, we we'll pray for them over there, but we don't want it over here, right? You're right. But yeah. but, but these Christians um, are saying, I'm I'm just like Jesus. You know, I, I just want to be like Jesus, and Jesus suffered, and and I, I, it's okay. I can suffer too, and it's an incredible. Amen test of faith and a testimony of your faith too to be able to be able to stand there and say something like that in the face of persecution yes. and then paul in these next verses just goes on to say listen all of these people who persecute the believers they're one day going to face the righteous judge mm -hmm. and god is going to be right and he is going to be just in all of his decisions but these people are who, because they have confronted and persecuted the godly people who were counted worthy of the kingdom of God, even though they were suffering, Paul says, listen, 
trust God in this. God is going to one day make it right. And so uh, verse six says, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation on them that trouble you. Wow, those are hard words. <laughs> Paul is saying, listen, there when he says they're going to God is going to recompense tribulation on them, mm. on these unbelievers, on these ungodly people. That's that means you know they're going to get theirs in the end. Yeah. And God, the righteous judge, is going to handle this righteously. I love the balance that's in scripture and the Bible talks about God being loving, God is love, but God is also just and right and is not going to allow the things that happen that um, that that cause trouble and pain uh, upon his own children to just to just go under the you know slide under the rug. It'll be it will be reconciled. And and all the way through for the Christians, for the child of God, we're reminded that when we do face those kinds of adversities, that we should depend upon the grace of God, which is always sufficient to see us through these things. Hmm. And, and then as Paul continues to in verses 7 and 8 to unfold this, boy, some of the things he's describing there, Corey, are frightening, aren't they? I know. It's, uh, certainly, not, it's certainly not the baby Jesus in the manger scene that, we're, <laughs> that we think of no, or the... Uh, Suffer the little children to come to me. Come sit, you know, come sit with me, little children. That, that's not the Jesus that yeah. we see here in these in this text. And, and, it, mm -hmm. and the important thing to remember is he's directing these toward the ungodly people. And as he's pouring out wrath upon them because of their unbelief, it, it says in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the these are going to be the end results of people that fail to trust and believe in the gospel. And, and that just makes it even more important for us to persevere and to be faithful in getting the gospel to an, undying, uh, an ungodly and dying world. Because if they end up dying in their unbelief and they do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8, then they are headed toward this terrible judgment <clears throat> which will be an eternal separation from God and uh, uh, in the place the Bible refers to as hell. Oh. And what a terrible end for them. Yeah. But even as Jesus said, Father, forgive them, all Christians should have the same attitude of, Father, forgive them. May they come to know you and be forgiven of their sins. I like the word choice here of, of, of the word rest. <clears throat> because in the face of persecution, you know, if someone's uh, talking, you know, completely very rude to you, or they're uh, making fun of you, or they're, you know, they're coming, they're they're wanting to do something as far as physically. The the, la the usually the last thing that I think of is is rest, right? Usually it's a put your shoulders up, it's tense up, it's I'm gonna fight back, um, but Paul saying here, "Hey, you need to rest with us. We've already experienced the persecution you're are, you're experiencing, and that you need to rest. And I think that rest comes from your that key point in that in the trust that this is this is going to happen. That all this this future fire, flaming fire, and angels and vengeance. It hasn't happened yet. It will happen, and you can trust that it will happen because God said it would." And that we can we can rest in that trusting of those things that are to come. Yeah, I agree. Praise uh, you're exactly right. Praise the Lord. In verses nine and ten, uh, we continue to see God warning these unbelievers of their end if they continue to go unrepentant in their life. And uh, I've included a quote here by C.S. Lewis. And I thought it was interesting the way he put it, but he said, quote, those who say to God, thy will be done. And then there are those that of whom God says in the end, thy will be done. In other words, you, you are going to get what you wanted all along, and that's rejection from me. You haven't and obeyed so, the gospel, 
and you're going yeah. to the, the end is separation. Yeah. It is. And you, you said separation there. You'll notice verse nine, it talks about everlasting destruction as part of this judgment against them. Mm -hmm. But then in verse nine, it actually says that, and I focused on that phrase, that they will be, a, eternal destination will be a part from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is true about hell is that people will be forever separated from the eternal creator, God. And it's just, that's going to be one of the terrible judgments of the unbelieving people is that they will be in this excruciating place, but they will never be able to reconcile with God and make things right between them and God because they were rejectors during their life. Wow. It's it's an amazing thing. Wow. And I I just it, it's hard it's hard to fathom that that idea. Um, yeah. But how how horrible it will be to be without hope. There not yeah. not another chance ever because you'll you won't even be in the presence of the Lord to even have it. There's no second chances <laughs> beyond that. And and so few of us as Christians really ever think, we don't even want to entertain the idea of what that means for the unbeliever. Yeah. Boy, it should be a motivation for us to share the gospel whenever we can to try to keep people, spare people from going to that separation from God. Absolutely. And that Paul brings it all around in verse 10 as he wraps up this section. And once again, he applauds the believers there in Thessalonica for facing all of this adversity. Mm -hmm. They need to trust God that he's going to handle it ultimately. But he also says that, uh, that he will be glorified. God will be glorified in his saints. And he had Paul admired uh, these followers of Christ so faithfully, even in the face of such adversity. Once again, the whole theme is, Hey, one day Jesus is coming and he's going to make all things right. Right. Okay. So we have the key of being thankful, the key of being trusting. Our final key comes from the last two verses of this chapter of being worthy. Verse 11 reads, Wherefore, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, what a great ending to this thought as he's been saying, stay faithful, persevere. But now he's bringing it to a conclusion to say, you know what, again, remain worthy and God will recognize that. I mean, he says we should be uh, remain worthy of this calling. The fact that we are a child of God, no matter what the adversity, we should be worthy of that calling, understanding that ultimately it will accomplish the good pleasure of his goodness. Yeah. And so uh, I just love the way Paul turns it all around and says, listen, what you have been doing is great. Just keep on doing it because that gives glory to God and he will receive the uh, good pleasure of this goodness that he is, in, is giving out. If they will walk uh, with faith in power that God provides. It's a really important part of them continuing to remain faithful and to persevere to the end, isn't it? Absolutely. And I, I love to recount to you the here the idea that it says that God would count you worthy. It's a it's it's one thing like in the arena of education. It's it's one thing for somebody who really doesn't know anything about education to say, Brother Ray, you're a great teacher, you know? And it's another thing for someone who is an incredible uh, educator to go, Brother Ray. You're you're a really good teacher. Yeah, you know, it, it 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 it's it's the same words, but it come it's who it comes from makes a huge difference. Yeah, so that's true. for God count for God counting you worthy, uh, I think it's just an incredible thought as a believer that if 
you were able to face persecution here, it says God would count you worthy of this calling. Yeah, and, and it, it, all of this happens as we give honor the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's who we're to honor. Right. And it's in that process of giving him the glory he deserves and the honor he deserves that ultimately we're going to experience the full transformation, the glorification. Uh, we're, we're going to endure to the end and through that process of growth and sanctification, ultimately we're going to be glorified. We're going to be in his presence and it will be in the perfection, the immortality that God has for all of us uh, as we join him one day in his uh, eternal bliss. I like how you ended this. The last sentence is the goal of every Christian is to always be like Jesus. Yep. And that's the whole idea. This, la this last part of being worthy is that we want to do that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of it ultimately goes back and points back to Jesus, who's made it possible for us to withstand persecution, but also to be um, thankful, to be trusting, and to be worthy uh, for him. And again, it all culminates in Paul saying, You've done great. You're a testimony to all of these other churches. Keep on doing it. But that's his encouragement. We're to be like Jesus, and we're to persevere. We're to be faithful to the very end. And even believers today are called to that high standard. Amen. Well, let's word, let, we'll end in a word of prayer today and thank God for his goodness and grace in our lives. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, that we can learn that in trying times and times of persecution, Lord, that we can uh, remain faithful, that we would be able to persevere through these times by being thankful, by being trusting, and by being worthy. Father, thank you for loving us. Father, I pray that if you do account to our lives, Lord, uh, a, a time of persecution, Lord, that we would uh, handle this, Father, just like the Thessalonians did, that our, our love and our charity would abound more and more, that our faith would grow, and that ultimately you would receive glory. Father, if it would cost us our lives, may we have one day be able to say, Father, forgive them. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing now in our classes and in our churches. Give us the wisdom and strength and fill us with the Holy Spirit to teach this word for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Ray. I appreciate your time together. Teachers, you get at them, man. We'll see you next Amen. time. Thank you, Corey. Thank you.